Everyone. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Pitch Fest. My name is Alex, and I'm one of the organizers tonight, along with Lauren, Laura, and Amy Brand. Amy, can you raise your hands? Who's maybe out of the room? We'll do that again when she's back. <laughs> Um, we welcome you to an evening where we're going to be watching eight startups. We're going to have five here in person, and we're going to have three that we're showing that will be based from startups in Chicago, Oxford, and London. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to welcome our panel of judges. Uh, first, we have Brian Gilman, a former 
bioinformatician, and he's the founder of, I think we're at six startups so far. And then we have Steve Scott, who's a, vet, a veteran startup um, guy himself, and he's now part of Digital Sciences executive team and also involved in the Catalyst Grant program. Uh, next we have uh, Adam Margolin, who's a partner at Spectrum Equity. Uh, Spectrum invests in later stage companies, and his company has also invested in the likes of SurveyMonkey, uh, Ancestry.com, and a ton of others. Then we have Mary Ann Snow. Uh, Mary Ann is a serial entrepreneur who has also been a professor at both uh, Bentley and Suffolk. And we're also we're going to have two judges tonight, uh, two uh, awards given up tonight. The first is going to be from our panel of judges, and our second is going to be from you, the audience. So everybody should have gotten a wad of cash when they walked in. So over the course of the evening, pay close attention to the different demos that, you, that you're seeing and figure out which one that you would invest your hard money into. So there's going to be two breaks, uh, one after the first set of startups uh, demos and the one uh, later in the evening. So you have two chances to decide which startups you'd like to back. You can back one, you can put a bit into um, all the different uh, companies at hand, and at the end we'll be tallying that all up and giving out the awards for the People's Choice and the Judges' Awards. Um, all the presenters today have also been um, have also been considered for the Digital Science Catalyst Grant, uh, which is a program that's given out twice a year uh, for $25,000 um, is awarded to the winner. And so uh, let's go into the logistics of how it works today. So each presenter is going to get five minutes. Uh, then there'll be about five minutes for Q&A. We're going to have the startup divided into two separate groups. So uh, the first group is going to be uh, Ecom Forward, Murmur Insights, Illuminate, and MyLab. We're going to have a beer and snack break. And then we're going to go on to Cardio Analytics, um, Keyword, Penelope, and uh, Deterium. And then you're going to have one more chance to invest your cash uh, before, we, um, before we make the final uh, decisions. And in that time, you're going to hear from, after which you'll hear from Tetra Science. Tetra Science is one of the former winners of the Catalyst Prize. And they're going to tell you a little bit about what they've learned since and what they've done since uh, winning the prize last year. So last but not least, everybody, cell phones on silent. Uh, second, uh, bathrooms are to the back and to the left. And if you're going to tweet, please use the hashtag. And if you have any questions, please make sure that you just grab uh, either one of the four of us who are here. Um, we can direct you in the right, whatever you need. So does anybody have any questions before we get started? No, <laughs> perfect. Uh, for anybody who in the back would like to, we do have some seats available. Open, okay. <laughs> All right, so let's get started. So first we're gonna uh, welcome up Econ Forward. Can you guys hear me? Yes? Okay, awesome. Um, hi everyone, I'm Ethan Barheit. I'm the founder of Econ Forward. Econ Forward is Twitter for research. Follow research questions that matter to you and get instant updates by email anytime there's a new relevant finding. Two summers ago, I was an intern at the Chicago mayor's office. That summer, the mayor had quite a bit on his plate. Gun violence was on the rise, teachers were picketing because schools were getting shut down, and there was an ongoing battle between environmentalists and building managers about energy regulations. Now, as the, as the intern, my job was to write memos that proposed new policy ideas grounded in academic research. Now, the average PhD student will spend about three years developing expertise on one research question. At the mayor's office, I had about three hours. So I would cobble together research from uh, Google Scholar, from news articles. I'd stick it into the memo, and that's the research that would bubble up to the top where the policy discussions were being had. I'm not alone in this experience of this way of using research. All the time, big decisions are being made 
without benefit of academic research that already exists. Take for instance uh, the, the, the problem of job, trainings pro job training programs in developing countries. Each year, NGOs spend over $1 billion implementing programs that help the poorest people in the world get jobs, which on the face of it seems like a pretty good idea, except that in just the last few years, study after study shows that job training programs don't work. And yet, this research hasn't gotten into the hands of the decision makers of many of these NGOs. So where's the disconnect? We're in the golden age of data-driven research, and yet the divide between research and practice has never been greater. Well, there are actually studies looking at this question, and surveys of politicians and practitioners cite three reasons why they're not drawing on research. The first, they don't have time to dig into academic papers. Second, they don't know where to look for the research itself. And third, they don't know what research they can trust. Well, Econ Forward solves this problem. Econ Forward collects and summarizes the latest findings in one place so that you can put the latest reliable research into practice. Let's take a look at how this really works. So imagine that you're one of these NGOs working on job training programs in a developing country. You go on to Econ Forward and find the page that asks the question, do job training programs work? On it, you can get up to speed uh, with a two minute summary of the latest findings, what we know so far. You can also stay in the know by following a research question and get instant updates to your email anytime there's a new finding. You can think of this as Twitter, but for research. And it's all, all information that you can trust, sorry. Uh, all of the information on the website is curated by academics uh, who, are, who have developed years of expertise on that particular question. So for job training programs, uh, there's an expert sourcing that information and pushing it out. Researchers love Econ Forward because it's a way for them to get their research into the hands of practitioners and to have a real impact on the world. And that's why there are 15 academics, professors and PhD students currently curating content for the website. You know, the, the trend these days is instant personalized notifications. When, I, when, I, uh, when, a, when someone I follow on Twitter tweets something new, I get a notification. When a musician I love puts out a new album, Spotify sends me a notification. As events unfold in the world, the New York Times is even sending me notifications. Research is way behind on this trend, and yet the demand is huge. NGOs want the latest findings to inform the programs they implement. Policymakers want the latest findings to craft the best policies for their constituents. For-profit companies want to know how their consumers act and where they should prioritize their research and development dollars. And right now, this site is all about economics research, but that's not its limit. One day, we'll push out notifications about scientific research, education research, research about psychology and climate change, so that no matter who you are, whether you're the NGO or a policymaker, whether you're a teacher or a parent or a for-profit company, you can get the findings you need to make a difference in the world and excel at what you do. Econ Forward is on a mission to make the world better by helping the world work smarter. Thanks so much. Okay, we're going to open it up for Q&A. Questions? There will be one day, and I'll let you know. But no, we're, we're web right now. It's still very early stage. Launching the beta next week. Yeah, so the question is, how are the research questions generated for the website? Um, so, so basically, we're focused on high impact, high demand questions. Things that we don't know a lot about so that you can track the progression of these questions as we learn more. Um, so we go to places like the World Bank and say, what are the problems in the field you're having, the questions that are coming up that researchers need to be thinking about. And we also go to professors who, who, who are keeping an eye on these kinds of things. 
so that you're really seeing the most, the most important questions on the website. And hopefully down the road, we'll be able to, to, to go into even more theoretical questions as well, so that we're catering not just to practitioners, but also even to researchers and PhD students. I think we're all lucky to work, oh, sorry, the, the question is, what's the cost model on getting people to curate? Um, I think we're all lucky to work in the space of research because academics are used to working for free. And uh, that's the cost model. Uh, you know, there's real power in crowdsourced information. And I, I think Wikipedia has proven that, but the issue with something like Wikipedia is you can't really rely on the information. So I think the real interesting problem for Econ Forward to solve is how do you draw, how do you leverage the power of a crowdsource model, but, but keep the information reliable and rigorous? And that's the problem that we're really focused on specializing in. Yeah. Yeah, of course. So the question is, how are the, the, the answers to the questions then? Well, we care a lot about rigor, academic rigor, so that the, the things that are getting implemented in the field by for-profit companies are the right things. So we actually add this extra layer of curation on top of what's already being done by the journals and, and by the academic community. So we're pulling these findings from papers that have been published or papers that are being worked on in seminars, working papers in economics. And then we add yet another level of curation, which are the academic experts on that specific question, so that you know you can get, you know you're getting really the best information out there. Yeah. Uh, the question was, what's my monetization strategy? So I, I, I you know, like like any good Web 2.0 company, I'd like to defer the question, but um, I, I think there are a couple interesting options. The first is that. Uh, you can work with institutions um, to, to help them understand the impact that an academic's research is having in the real world. So we can come up with metrics to say, you know, this person's research has made it into a thousand NGOs who are now using it to, to, to implement how they do education programs in developing countries. Um, that's, that's one way to do it. Uh, another way is that what we're specializing in is the distribution of Expert expertise, expert knowledge, and um, there are there in the world of, of marketing, for example, there are companies where you can pay to get your expert questions answered. So you can imagine a monetization model where we're building on top of this this basic level of expert curation, where you can then go and say, from this expert, I want, uh, I need this this extra level of expertise. I'm going to go now pay pay for that. Um, so so we can start to sell expertise. Yeah. Are there existing platforms that are similar? That, uh, this is really the this is this is uh, in its own category. There is there is one company that caters to doctors. It's, there are actually a few, but the big one is called Up to Date. Now, Up to Date um, is a it's a point of care system where uh, as, if you're a doctor, you can you know you're sitting with a patient, you can now search on their system and get sort of the latest information on, on whatever issue you're trying to, to work on. And I think this is exciting because it actually validates the idea, one, that people outside of academia want research, and two, that they need an extra level of curation to make it effective or, or to, to, to digest it. Um, and, and the thing that's, that's really special about Econ Forward is that rather than having to go onto a website and get the information, the latest findings, we're about push, not pull. So, so you follow a question, and any time there's a new finding, you will know about it right away. Cool, that was the last question, sorry. Uh, thank you so much, guys. Please come talk to me. I'd love to talk to you more about it. Remember? Good? Live stream? Live stream. Um, all right. 
Yeah. 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 Where's the portable mic? Let's do that. Um, well, you have to come away from the seat. You have to come away from the seat. Okay. Away from the seat. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ethan Kobit, and I'm the co-founder of Mimmer Insights. So um, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit today about what we do. Um, over here are Terry and Cass, people I work with. Um, so what exactly does Mimmer do? Mimmer automates the sales environment of life science companies who sell products and services to researchers, saving them time. So kind of really shortly, what are we? We're a sales and marketing platform for those companies. So what's the pain point that we're trying to address? We're trying to address that these companies spend a lot of time manually qualifying huge numbers of leads. When you're selling a specific product or service, you need to know if it's gonna fit a particular uh, research application. And then even if, even if you know that that fit is good, you have to manually track that researcher to figure out um, if they can actually pay for it, because they're not getting money on you know, annual budgets, they're getting money based on grants. So what's, what's our goal here? What's our solution? Memory wants to smoothly integrate external and internal data to save our users time, and hopefully increase their rate of growth. Um, so what am I talking about with external data? External data is data that's being pulled from the research environment. So that's like grant data, publication data, patent data. All this is being aggregated together into a profile, or a, excuse me, a database of research profiles. And internal data is data that the company owns. That's their CRM. That's the contact information that they've collected about their own contacts. So the product itself is a web platform. It breaks into two major pieces called Search and My Leads. Uh, search is a window into that researcher profile database. And My Leads is a place where once you've found researchers that you're interested in tracking, you can move them from search into my leads. And you can also take existing contacts in your CRM and dump them into my leads. And once they're there, you're gonna get alerts about what's happening in that you know, researcher's environment. Are they getting a new brand? Are they starting a new project? Are they moving a lab? All of these are important insights uh, for salespeople and you know, marketing people and business development reps. So what's the primary market for this for us? The primary market is any company who sells equipment, services, compounds, whatever it is, the scientific research. Um, they have to have a direct sales team. And often they're gonna be startup based. And the reason for that is companies like Thermo Fisher, Agilent, Perkin Elmer, these companies have huge departments for whom this is their job. They take leads that are coming from marketing, they sit on them, and they deliver them to the sales team and you know, interact with the sales team to make sure they're getting these researchers at the right time. Startups cannot handle that kind of cost. And so we're shouldering some of that burden. So often you're going to see our customers being uh, probably less than 400 employees. What's our scaling strategy? Our scaling strategy is that we're going to kind of nurture the close relationships that we already have with companies that are using our product. Um, we're going to move slow. And we're going to establish a presence in important cities like San Diego, Boston, Salt Lake City. These are all life science hubs. And we want to collect data on exactly how effective we are for those teams. How much time are we actually saving? Like, am I cutting down prospecting time by 15% or 25%? How am I affecting the rate of close? Is it going up by 10%, 5%? You know, where are we? And once we have those statistics, we want to transition to an inbound marketing model, pulling the customers to us as opposed to doing what I do now, which is reach out to them. Um, we have about six companies currently using the product uh, and about 10 more in there. What's our pricing model? Our pricing model basically prices um, in big, uh, bulk, um, year, you know, yearly subscriptions based on the size of the company, and that's because Memory is a collaborative tool. This isn't just a prospecting tool. This is a team, or this is a tool for teams, and we want to encourage every company to add as many people as possible. You know, like add your mother, add whoever you need. Um, and so, you know, that's that's how the pricing works there. And then you can see that our revenue projections are following the scaling strategy that we had before. We're starting out slow, we're collecting that data. And then as time goes on, we want to um, have that, you know, have that revenue increase in more exponential rate. So I'm actually finished. Um, if you have any questions, please ask me them. And actually, if anyone would like to see a demo, I have four slides that kind of, you know, jam pack what the product looks like and how it works um, together at the end of this PowerPoint. So if anyone asks me that question, I'll show you that little demo. Okay. Okay, we're open for questions.
Fantastic. <laughs> Love that. All right. Um, it's right here. So, like I said, Mirror's platform has two pieces. Search for my leads. You can see them up at the tab. This is kind of the expanded search window. You can enter full text keywords here to get, um, you know, to pull up any researcher who's associated with that, you know, that, that text keyword. Or you can use some of these advanced filters here. Um, researcher name, grant start, things like that. And then that grants, if you open that up, you get some granular controls, like BOA number, grant type. Um, and then this next slide here, when you actually run a search, this is what it looks like. You can see what the search terms are up there. Sell off apoptosis, mammalian, grant type is K99, which indicates a researcher who's kind of a postdoc who's opening up a new lab. Um, and so you can whittle those results down from 15,000 to 30 really quickly. And once you, once you find these researchers that you like based on those names, institution, and grant number, you can, you can do this for a while and, um, oh, sorry, over, over here we have also have the researcher profile. If you actually click on any of these boxes, you'll get this researcher profile, which shows you again location, um, and then each one of those boxes is a grant. You can expand that and you'll see what's the grant type, what's the amount, when did it start, all that information, long before abstract. Um, and if you want to save this person, because maybe they're not a good prospect now, but they will as soon as they get their next stage of the grant. Like, for example, K99 grants transition to R00 grants, which have a lot more money. Um, you can track them in my list. So you can save them into one of the work folders, or there's folders that are shared by, a, you know, like what, what, what other people in your company are doing. Um, you can edit permissions by that call. And if you open one of those folders and click a lead, you'll get the same profile view you were getting in search, just to, you know, again, remind yourself of, of what's going on there. You can also write notes. There's some basic CRM functionality there. Um, and then one of, the, one of the big important parts of Mimmer is that CRM integration that I was talking about before, which is you can prospect all you want, but if you really want an effective sales environment, you need to be talking about 150,000 leads, or as somebody Kirk and Elmer might say, lots and lots and lots more than that. And so we really encourage integrating your CRM because then you're going to be dumping in all those sales contacts, and we're going to be tracking those. If they get a new grant or if they get a new project, we're going to tell you via email, and you're going to get it in that notification. So, such as the end of my day. What's, what's an example of like a hobby? Someone in services, someone So the question was, what's an example of a hot lead? Um, a hot lead would be like one of well, one of our customers. Um, it, they sell a fluid cytometer, sell a cell sorter, and basically they're looking for somebody who ha you know who, who's who's doing cell apoptosis, who's studying cell apoptosis, maybe for like cancer. And they want to be flagged as soon as this person gets, like I said, an R00 grant after their K99 grant. Because they want somebody who's in early stage research, but the fluid centometer is actually pretty expensive. They're like, K99 grant may be $80,000. This thing costs 20 grand. Like, you know, they, they, they need that. And um, for certain research applications and for certain researchers who don't want to go to a, a cell sorting facility and pay all that money, this is a good alternative. It's cheaper, and they can do it in lab. So, you know, that would be an example. Yeah. Salesforce is a service that serves that services everybody. This service is specific to life sciences. Um, Salesforce does reporting, and but but Salesforce doesn't actually track via external data sources. Salesforce isn't going to flag you when somebody gets a grant or um, releases like a publication. You could absolutely build a service on the Salesforce, except I've already built the service on the Salesforce and. <laughs> And you can pay me five thousand dollars a year to do it, whereas your developer is going to cost one hundred and thirty or one hundred forty thousand dollars a year to do it. So it feels cheaper to me. Uh, do I call on questions or do you? Yeah, you can. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to go back to the front. Okay. So again, like the data sources that we're using right now are all public. Like I said, NSF, NIH, things like that. We're actually looking at incorporating more privately funded. Data sources. That being said, there are 180 people at Pfizer right now who are working off of NIH grants. I was looking like in the last three months, two people at New England Bio Labs got NIH grants. That you, you can still track private industry through public funding. Um, and as time goes on, we will integrate those private data sets. Yes. I'm, I'm so sorry, I couldn't actually hear you. The size of our database. Right now, the database has 200,000 researcher profiles that are, um, and, and like millions of, of a different kind of individual pieces of data, like grants and publications, that are aggregated together. So it's 200,000 researchers right now. And by the end of the summer, um, we're going to move beyond the domestic market into international, things like that. 
Um, yes, back there in the plot. Well, so the thing is, uh, I'm sorry, I'll repeat the question. So the question was, this is information, but how do we know if a researcher is actually going to be able to use this piece of equipment? The thing is, I don't do this. I, prefer, I provide a marketing and sales platform for trained sales teams, tra sales teams to do these, this. These uh, salespeople have PhDs, and they know what their research application is for their devices. They can approach you and say, I know that you're, selling, you're studying cell apoptosis, and I know this can make your life easy. Um, yes, in the black. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So the question. So, so the, the question is two part. I'm going to try to remember it, which is basically, don't we want information about what the researchers are actually using? Yes, that's in the methods section of publications. And also, a company here, Lab Guru, is like really tracks that sorts of information. So there are data sources that we can dive into for that. Um, the second part of your question was grants are some grants are collaborative. How do we deal with that? Well, grants have grant types, and there are certain grants that are collaborative. And like like a K99 grant is not collaborative. It's given to one researcher, but there are collaborative there are collaborative grants. So once you have a good working knowledge of grant types, which are some of the insights that we provide, we have like guides that we do, we do personal consultations. You'll start to understand which grant types work for your organization and how you can use those grant types to get access to you know, the different people who are collaborating on that same thing. That was the last question. Sorry, everybody. Thanks for listening. I really appreciate it. diagnosed with melanoma. It was a spot on the center of my back. Um, and my mom actually spotted it and told me to go to the doctor. I went to my primary care physician uh, who said, let's be cautious. You know, we'll just take a biopsy. And about a month later, I found out it was melanoma. Since then, I've had two more melanoma diagnoses. I'm responsible for keeping track of any changes that happen to my skin. And I could have cancer right now which is a pretty scary thought. Uh, I'm not alone, though. About one in five Americans will get skin cancer at some point in their lives. Most of those people will go to the primary care physician that they know about. Uh, but the scary thing is about half of primary physicians are actually not confident in their ability to detect skin cancer. So what we're creating is a tool to allow primary physicians to make better decisions when they're evaluating patients. So what are we creating? We're creating a, a smartphone attachment that captures both high quality images and information in outside of the visual spectrum. That communicates with our software platform that has image processing and machine learning uh, to provide that doctor with more information about the skin lesion than what they can just see with the naked eye. Uh, and help them, help to inform them to decide, do I want, want to recommend this patient go see a, primary, or a dermatologist? So we've already done a little bit of prototyping, testing our device on people's skin um, and some back-end prototyping as well, doing image processing and machine learning. We think that what we're working on can have a huge impact. On the patient level, what we're ultimately doing is driving expertise closer to them. So we want to provide better outcomes for these patients. From the system level, if we can move patients from later stage diagnoses, stage three and stage four, to stage one and stage two, that would provide huge overall system savings. And then from the research perspective, we're researchers, so we've faced this challenge again and again. It's hard to find high quality research. So what we're doing is creating 
a way uh, and fixing that problem for researchers in the future to where they can access our information and better understand skin cancer as a disease and take it to that next level and use our platform to try out different treatments and provide better actual outcomes for patients like me who are diagnosed with melanoma. The problem is big. So there are a lot of competitors in this space. But what we're doing is a little bit different. Our competition primarily ranges from low-end technologies, such as cell phone apps that you can download an app right now, take a picture of a skin lesion, and it'll give you um, an analysis. These are not FDA approved, and they're pretty low accuracy. That ranges up to higher-end technologies like Melifine that are available in some dermatology offices. They're cumbersome to operate, and they're really expensive to run. What we're doing is creating a low-cost, portable solution for primary care physicians to empower that patient to know more about their own body. We have a great team spanning primarily from MIT, from both east and west sides of campus, tech technological and business, um, with some uh, oncology research. We're looking to grow our team primarily in the capabilities of image processing and machine learning and clinical expertise. We've been working on this idea since January and have been through a few different processes to make sure we're developing the right product for the right person. Uh, we've entered the 100K in, in the MIT's Hacking Medicine competition, um, but we've been working on it and we're pretty passionate about this idea. Um, so I told you just now how we think we can change skin cancer diagnostics. If you'd like to come talk to me, please come find us after this. Thank you. Questions? other metrics that actually show that primary care physicians aren't nearly as good as, as dermatologists at detecting skin lesions that has been done a few times. This is cited from uh, a specific paper. Next question. Yeah, oh, repeat, yeah. Um, so she asked, what's the liability risk for this sort of thing? Um, so, I, correct my numbers, but I think uh, primary care physicians are in the range of 50 to 60 percent effective at spotting melanomas, and dermatologists are in the range of 80 percent effective at detecting melanomas. So, I, I see your, your point. Um, what we are doing is much higher than what's currently the standard. Yeah? Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, the question was when we when do we estimate clinical trials? I think we're we're still figuring that out. Um, but it's a, I mean, it's a long timeline because we have quite a few iterations, and we're not just doing melanoma; we're doing other skin cancers as well. Yeah, so um, there are a few things in, in play there. One is when people are worried about skin lesions, they go to their doctor for a serious evaluation. There are some other dermatology, teledermatology tools, uh, but they're, they're not widely used. Patients aren't accepting them um, as much. That may change in the future. Um, the other side of it is I mean, we're going through FDA approval, and we want that patient to be part of the healthcare pipeline. We're not trying to take away the business from dermatologists and primary care physicians. We're trying to just better enable it. Yeah. 
<laughs> That's a great question. Um, the question was how much capital is required to get off the ground. I can't give you a straight answer right now. <laughs> Definitely. That's uh, so the one. The question. Yeah, and so the, the, uh, the statement was that the clinical trials factor in, uh, the size of the clinical trial factors into how much it's going to cost. Oh, yeah, I, so I, I wish I could give you an answer. We haven't figured that out yet. Is the product effective for all skin types and tones? Yes, so um, one of the reasons that we're, so the question was, is this effective for all skin types and tones? And one of the reasons we're looking outside of the visual spectrum is because you're constrained by uh, just the, the optical spectrum, uh, which is an inhibitor to expanding. So uh, there are specific types of cancer that are common in specific ethnicities that aren't, you know, aren't white, so you need to be able to detect those. Questions? That's it. All right. ago I had a conversation with my brother Rocky, who was a screenwriter out in Los Angeles. After hearing that he pitched scripts to CBS, Disney, and Nicolas Cage, that's right, the ghost writer himself, all in one week, I had to ask, how do you find time to both write and, and uh, coordinate these meetings? Rocky simply replied, well, my agent, of course. Now, Rocky is represented by agents from the United Talent Agency, which is one of the premier agencies in the world. And these agents once said to him, you concentrate on producing golden scripts and leave the rest to us. Now, this got me thinking, why doesn't a similar system like this exist in science? Why doesn't a young scientist with an innovative idea have someone like this working for him? <laughs> Where is the RE gold in science? Why do we force innovators to split their attention between innovation and marketing that innovation? Why do we make entrepreneurship in science so damn difficult? Well, let me first explain some of the ramifications of this difficulty and the science education system as a whole and what I believe can be done. Now, early stage scientists all begin on the same traditional path where they spend five to seven years in graduate school and then move on to one or more postdoctoral fellowships where they will stay until they can publish in a high enough impact journal where they can land a rare uh, uh, academic faculty position. However, according to a 2014 National Academy's uh, report, there's an immense bottleneck that is forming at the postdoctoral level, where almost 50% of highly qualified, advanced degree holding po uh, uh, scientists are com all competing for dwindling industrial science positions. Now, I believe the answer to this growing problem, which undoubtedly will detract from scientific advancement, is building opportunities beyond the traditional path, for, especially for early stage scientists. Enter my lab. Now, my lab is a startup company focused solely on the young innovator. We are designing an external support system that will facilitate multiple facets of the entrepreneurial process, including strategic networking, product development and marketing support, and in time, financing. In short, we're going to do the dirty work to allow the scientists to create their magic. However, you might be asking yourself, but isn't Boston already saturated with, with incubators and accelerators and things of that sort? Well, let me explain where, where my level fit in and why it is needed. You'll notice that there are plenty of groups in the area focused on supporting projects related to healthcare, and some that are interested in other aspects of technology. However, rarely do these firms focus their attention on university students. And even those that are university-based don't concentrate solely on healthcare, especially those uh, proposed by young scientists from undergraduate and graduate studies. My lab will fill that essential gap. We will concentrate all efforts on the early stage university scientists who have innovative ideas that can be launched in 
next generation companies that would uh, focus on life science research, uh, digitizing aspects of healthcare, uh, and overarching, overall increasing or uh, forwarding the uh, advancement of, of, of uh, science. Now, we will do so with the added benefit that these scientists will be able to escape what I call the Harvard tax. So say you're a scientist, a young scientist uh, working in a, a research lab at Harvard, uh, at an affiliate hospital at Harvard. You generate an in innovative idea in that lab, you, and that, that idea takes off, and you say you launch a company. You stand to lose up to 75% of royalty and revenue rights simply because you generated an, an affiliated hospital. So let me quickly fill you in on our two-tier plan for building this experiment. Tier one of our development plan is much of what I've described, where we will be working with individual innovation teams to assist them in all things related to building next generation companies. We will be acting as a sort of agency for these scientists, much like the one that supports my brother's writing endeavors. Ultimately, as things grow and we establish ourselves as, as a management team, we hope to build an actual physical incubator environment. This, this incubator environment will consist of a unique structure that will be able to uh, uh, allow us to differentiate ourselves from the, the current market where we will put in place a partnership structure which, where, where each innovator will have equal ownership of each other's projects. Each project will be developed in-house under the MyLab banner as to reduce overhead costs of launching individual companies. This will work to reduce competition with groups like PeerCap. However, until we are this, this Tier 2 MyLab point, we will continue working with individual innovation teams. In fact, one of the members groups presenting here tonight uh, were in early talks with. I'll let you guess who. So, win or lose, we'd love to speak to each contestant after the competition. Let's build something cool. Thank you. And I'd like to invite my, my head of science, Brad. Some beer, beer bottles. <laughs> we do things different at my lab. Questions? Yes. If you had the money, um, well, I think the big issue is having the money. Um, oh, sorry. So the question was, if I had the money, why would I go to other consulting groups in the area to develop my company? Um, when we surveyed groups and students in the graduate studies and postdoctoral you know, post fellows, um, a big barrier obviously is money. Students don't have money at this point. And another thing is, is understanding how to acquire money. We're, we're in a system where we're so sheltered from, from kind of the business realm where we're taught that if you want to sell out, you can go and work in industry. So it's, it's really a, a, a complete divide between understanding how to manage capital and, and obtain capital and apply that to pursuing ideas. And so what we really want to do is facilitate that process with, with um, academics uh, to connect them with the right VC firms and to uh, utilize that funding to develop their ideas. And to just chime into what uh, Craig was saying right now is both of us have a very strong life sciences background. We're both life sciences students from undergrad. We've worked in labs for the last few years. And we've really got a clear understanding of what the real problems are as far as the system is concerned. And I think um, our goal is to kind of put ourselves in the other person's shoes. And I think that's what we're, uh, how we distinguish yeah. ourselves. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, how do you respond as the scientific community involved in that kind of So, right. really describing movement, right? So, scientists are getting much more training while they're in graduate school. Right. They're not getting the training. They're not getting the so the question was, as the education systems evolve, um, how will we uh, work to fit into this, this environment? Well, I would be the first to say that this process is extremely slow, especially at Harvard and MIT. Um, but large, a large part of my lab and what we hope to instill is an education program, is to teach, take these, these students who are, who are currently in this ac fully academic uh, uh, track and then bring them out and teach them that entrepreneurial skills to kind of instill that next generation of entrepreneurship and science, which will hopefully gener generate new jobs. So we are very open to working 
uh, with universities to develop these kind of programs to uh, uh, forward this advance because it's it's a win-win. If if, if we're if we stand to lose money and and the universities finally start teaching entrepreneurship, I think that's a win, win for us because we're we're beyond just solely looking at money. We want to advance this mission. We, this like as Trian described, this is something we grew up in and, and something that we, we fully understand that there's complete uh, void uh, uh, in terms of, of alternative careers in science. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, so what, what, what is our <laughs> common trend? Um, so what our role will be, so the question is, what will our role be for connecting uh, students with advisory boards and funding bodies and things of that sort? Um, so we, we kind of want to take an all-encompassing all uh, uh, role in, in that sense, where we, we have a, a pretty strong strategic science and uh, business uh, network in Boston that's growing every day. Um, and so we really want to utilize that network that's, that's in place right now to make the connections that can help either technically, financially, um, you know, and, and business development, uh, grab those connections uh, based on our current network and, and then, uh, then relay that to our, to our, uh, our, the, our clients that we're working with. Yeah, Craig and I actually uh, met while working uh, at the Harvard Stem Cell Institute uh, a few years ago and uh, they have uh, been extremely helpful working with us and helping us grow our network and connecting us to all the professors as part of, uh, of the Harvard uh, Stem Cell Institute program. And Rakeem and Maureen, who's uh, part of the Harvard Stem Cell Institute today, right. and actually coming Maureen, and so we've been working with them before. And right, and and, and, academics and so on our, our, our current advisory board, other uh, Harvard faculty. And so this has been an immense uh, a resource for us for building our network. Yes. Right. Yeah. Is that, uh, so the question is, how will we get around the legal problems of, of, of working with students who are being trained in the lab? Um, so when we're, we're looking for projects, they have to be a degree separate from what they're currently working on in, in the research lab. Because that's going to bring a whole other bag of issues if we try to take what they're working on in their academic lab and apply it to an external uh, you know, private, uh, private body. So um, it's going to be something where we're, we're, we're not only looking for the right projects, but for the right people. We're really good, willing to go the step beyond and, you know, say you're tired, you work in your lab from 9 to 5, and you want to continue and <laughs> you want to work on a, a different idea, you're going to have to come into our, our company and work from 5 to 2 kind of thing. Because this is what, this is what, what graduate school is all about. Uh, work, working with the time you have, and if students are, are, are motivated enough, um, I think that. Uh, I think Boston's is the best place for them. Yeah, right. So. Okay, in the back. Can you speak up? Okay. So uh, I think the question is, have we managed to raise any VC money so far? Um, so when you look at it, um, in in in. Investment in a management team as young as us is always a process. Um, we're first-time entrepreneurs, and, and we're kind of we're going down uncharted territory. Uh, but we have uh, significant connections in the angel community in Boston, and are working with groups like the Dorm Room Fund to land our first initial funding, which we will hope to then apply to uh, other other uh, the projects that we hope to uh, 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 fund. So um, it's really about building the connections, and um, if we don't land enough money for ourselves, we at least want to give the, the projects that we work on the right connections to put them in the best place to land, land funding. All right, thank you. All right, guys, we're going to take a short break. Um, so here's your chance to, if you're, if you're in love with any of the four companies, you don't want to wait the voting board at the back. Um, if you want to wait to the end, you'll again have a chance to invest your money later. Um, bar is open, food's ready to eat, um, and we'll have about uh, 15 minutes for everybody to get sorted. And
All right, guys, time to grab your seats. We're ready to start the second set of demos. Okay, so, oh. so everyone get in your seats, uh, we're going to get started. The next uh, demo is a video demo. Um, and then uh, we'll follow up with the Q&A with James. He's on the phone. My name is James, and I'm the founder of Penelope. Thanks very much for inviting us to submit a video application to PitchFest. Penelope, then, is an automated editorial assistant. She screens manuscripts as they're being submitted to a journal and gives authors instant feedback, explaining how they can make their work better. We hope that Penelope will be considered to be an extra team member of a journal's workforce. So she's kind of a 24-7 editor, but a fraction of the price. When an author uploads, they'll see something like this. So their manuscript is on the right-hand side, and the results of all of Penelope's checks from the left. It's interactive, so when you click on this button, the manuscript automatically scrolls to the portion of text where the problem is. Now, we want Penelope to be quite educational, so when she makes a suggestion, she explains why it's important, and then provides links to further resources where the academic can learn more about that issue. So we hope then that by having this um, rich feedback, we're going to then improve that author's work in the future, so they won't make that same mistake again. If Penelope can explain to somebody why power calculation is important, then maybe the next experiment will be adequately powered, even if this one says. The feedback that we're giving and the checks that Penelope is carrying out can be totally customized to particular journals. On the left hand side, you can see all the checks that Penelope can currently do. Penelope can make sure that citations are present, that references are present, and that they're in the right format for that journal. She can make sure that figures and tables are all there, that they're in the right order, and again, in the right format. She can check for the presence of all necessary sections, and she can also make sure that statements are there, so ethics approval, patient consent. She can look to ensure that data has been cited properly, according to the course working group on the citation guidelines. And she can also make sure that URLs have been archived in a bot. Over the next few months, we are going to add a few more checks. We want to make sure that p-values are accompanied by a measure of precision, confidence intervals. We want to make sure that code has been cited, and we want to pull out the funders and then enforce the funders' mandates. We're also working with the Equator Network to build a tool that's going to help authors find and then complete the reporting checklists that are pertinent to their that particular piece of research. In the future, we want to make sure that figure legends are as informative as they should be. So people have included the sample size, the number of replicates, um, and that that figure legend is rich. We want to help people report their statistics clearly. So we want to make sure that they validated the assumptions that that test makes whether they've checked for normality, whether they've checked for equal variance, whether their sample size is big enough for the test that they've used. And then we want to make manuscripts more useful to machines. So we've been talking already with the Research um, Resource Identification Initiative about how we can encourage authors to cite their antibodies, cite their animals, cite their software. And we've also been talking to the Human Variable Project about encouraging standardized nomenclature for genetic and genetic variations, these kinds of things. So there's a lot of really exciting stuff that we can use Penelope for in the 
future. We've not done this alone. As I said, I'm James and I've got a background in neuroscience. And then there's Chris, who's our lead developer. He's got 15 years of experience building software for big companies. We've also got an intern for the next few months from UCL. We've got a grant from the UK government to develop the alpha version, just a small one from UKTI. And we've really, every step of the way, we've been getting feedback from publishers, from editors, who have helped guide the product and shift the be into something that we hope really could be useful. I think that's about it. Hopefully that gives you a really clear overview of what Penelope is and what we hope she's going to become over the next few months. And yeah, I hope you like it. Thanks very much. James, can you hear us? I can, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. So, Great. Great. Um, Thanks very much. Why don't you go, uh, we're going to open up for questions. Anyone? Okay, there's a few in the back, Laura. So I'm sort of stunned. I could see how it work, could work for a decent writer, but what about a really bad writer? <laughs> uh, that's a really good question, actually. So we've been testing Penelope on a whole bunch of manuscripts that we've managed to um, gather from all different sources. Some of them are written pretty well, some of them not so well. Um, and. So if you mean by a bad writer, if you mean someone who maybe the, uh, um, English isn't so strong, or maybe you mean someone that's just a bit sloppy and the document is quite sloppy, uh, and we're working hard to deal with both of those things. So sloppy documents, that's fine, you can deal with those quite well. And then when it comes to um, poor English, we have to make sure that our um, algorithms that we use are kind of strong enough but also capable of fuzzy matching so that we can uh, be generous enough to deal with those kind of ambiguities, I guess. Hopefully that, that answers the question. This is, by the way, this is probably the weirdest thing I've ever done on the internet. <laughs> it feels really bizarre to be talking to people I can't see. James? Who is your main audience? I'm not sure if audience is the correct word, but I'm wondering who is this product directed toward? So we are designing it at the moment to be a tool that journals will pay for, and they will then offer it to their submitting authors. So ultimately, it's we hope it's going to make journals um, lives easier. It's going to make them better science and more easily. Um, but we're also considering releasing an author only version which will help authors to make their work valuable but it won't actually be tailored to the specific needs of a journal. So it won't be enforcing journal mandates or journal styles, um, journal rules. It will just be a kind of generic version, which will be pushing the best practices that people like the Equator Network or the Force working groups are trying to encourage. Um, so I guess in answer to your question then, the main customer, we're mainly targeting journals and publishers, but we're also considering targeting authors directly as customers. I was wondering what publishers are currently working with now to do the same process and what this what Penelope would, would add that is currently lacking. Um, so the publishers that we've spoken to, it seems like they have a few 
um, tricks up their sleeve to deal with some of these issues. So for instance, looking for missing citations or um, general formatting, spelling errors. They have a lot of word macros that they use. So you'll open up a file and then run it through all these macros and that will flag up errors. Um, this solution isn't ideal because it takes quite a lot of time. And even when you then find the errors, you've then got to write back to the author, get them to provide the missing references or the missing figures and these kind of things. And that takes a lot of time. Um, so I hope Penelope will be better because she's giving instant feedback to the author so they can fix it there and then. And then when it comes to the more complex stuff, so um, encouraging uh, reporting guidelines or um, checking for complex intervals and things like that, but we haven't, I haven't come across any um, tools that can do all of those things. Um, they, may, they may exist and I'd love to hear about them if they do, but I haven't found them yet. Uh, so, for some things, it seems to be quite fact-based, whether a conf confidence interval is in the document or not. What do you do about things where you're trying to improve the language of the individual? How do you manage that? Um, so, at the moment, we're focusing Penelope on making science better. We're not really treating it as a general proofreading grammatical checker. There are, there are, I think, other solutions that are better for that. So, going to a professional editor that can change, help you work with your language, or we're even using some online tools like Hemingway App, which are specifically for um, grammar and readability, I guess. Um, but you're right. So we, uh, you mentioned that we have these kind of um, structured things and then less structured stuff that we're checking for and that is reflected on by the code itself so part of it is feature extraction where you're picking out specific um, features of the text and in a results section for instance that can sometimes be quite standard the way that people report PIDs and things like this um, and then for the more uh, the more complicated stuff is when you have to use other tools for natural language processing and it's, it's a bit more kind of probabilistic and um, a different way of, yeah, it's, it's reflected differently in the code. I, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> so is this a tool that would be part of the submission process? So you, you mentioned getting quick feedback to authors. So is this something that you would run through a piece of software on the website when you were submitting a paper? Or is this something that only the, the journal or the publisher is going to do and then send you feedback? Uh, we want it to be the first part of the submission process. So we've been talking with editorial manager about hooking it up right at the front of that pipeline. So an author comes to a journal website, they click on the submit button, and the first thing they're gonna do is run it through Penelope, and this will be a tailored version of Penelope that's specific to that journal's rules and requirements. Um, they might then have to go away and make some changes, these might be small fixes, they might be bigger fixes that take a bit more time. But once they are happy with that version and Penelope is kind of giving it the green light, then from there they'll go through the submission process, the standard submission process that we all know already. Um, the only difference will be that Penelope will generate a compliance form which an editor can then look at once it's been submitted. Um, there'll be a URL to that compliance form so editors can see what summary of what Penelope did and any outstanding issues, this kind of thing. So yeah, right at the beginning of the submission pipeline. Okay, thanks James, that was the last question. Thanks so much. Okay, so we have another video one. Um, e. Katerina, can you hear me? Can you hear us? Yes, we can hear you. Um, so we're gonna yeah, show your video and then we'll open it up for Q&A.
Hello, my name is Fedor Komsola, and our team is developing solutions for researchers and educators. Today, I would like to tell you about a novel archival methodology that we are developing for online data management. Online data publishing is becoming more routine for scientists and can be done in various ways, from basic HTML tables and open access MySQL servers to a more sophisticated high-level services like Figshare and Plotly. While conducting surveys and interviews with researchers to learn about their data management practices, we realized that one of the major pains that these scientists have is gathering information published in various catalogs, extracting a subset of data for further analysis, and reproducing the pipelines of other researchers. This problem often arises because the data sets generated by scientists are big and diverse, making it difficult to store, manage, share, and publish data all in one place. To solve this problem, we're creating the Terry, a tool which helps to organize the process of data acquisition from various online sources. Let's imagine several researchers who publish their data sets. Researcher 1 uses Figshare, while researcher 2 prefers an old school method of text data tables, and researcher 3 has his own MySQL server. On the other side, a peer scientist wants to access all these data. Currently available methods of data publishing are lacking the ability to query across desperate databases from a single location and consolidate data for further meta-analysis. Deterium provides the end user with the ability to query data from a single location. When data are not too big, Deterium will allow interactive visualization and table view and filtering. For a more technology-savvy researcher, Deterium will provide API direct access. Most importantly, Deterium will allow to handle big data with a good query system to extract smaller data subsets for further analysis. Deterium will have a significant impact on the scientific community by enabling scientists to further explore data sets and make new discoveries without expenditures on data collection. By providing a web interface, Deterium will reduce the cost of developing and maintaining the front end of existing databases. Journals and publishers will also be able to utilize the Deterium interface for receiving data sets from authors. The Deterium will also have a significant impact on communication of the scientific findings to the general public. Directive data summaries and in-browser visualization directly linked to the scientific references will engage the general public in the research process. We position Deterium in a way to avoid direct competition with hosting providers and database engines. In contrast to existing services, the term is focused on data acquisition rather than publishing and hosting. Thus, we are not competing with other services for market access. We have identified providing complementary services in the form of customer support, consultations, training, and custom data visualization. The major expenses right now are for hiring software developers and system administrators. Our executive team is well qualified for development of this project, as we, in combination, have experience in data-driven research, software development, and market research. I have a doctorate degree in biological sciences and 10 years of experience in experimental and computational research. In addition to overseeing the whole project, I will lead the outreach initiative of the Terium in order to bring scientific results closer to the public. Alexander Kowarp is completing a PhD in astrophysics and has over eight years of experience with high-performance computing and analyzing and managing big data. He is the chief programmer and will also lead the collaboration with our international colleagues. Oleg Turkin is a PhD student at the Booth School of Business with extensive experience in computational work in both physics and financial data models. Oleg has been instrumental in developing the business side of the project. Together, we have already built an open source laboratory information management platform called LabRepo and have taken this product to market. This project has been supported by various local entrepreneurial organizations. We hope that you're excited about the Deuterium project as we are. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> you're excited about the Deuterium. Okay. Um. We'll open up for questions. Are you going to compete with LabGuru or Kirk and Elmer or Thermo Fisher or any of the other um, competitors in this marketplace? Uh, so we uh, we focus on data acquisition. All those uh, services you mentioned. 
they are focused on data collection and data storage. So if I'm a researcher and I want to access some external database, so Atarium will be a solution. I think, I, I think uh, I have a question here, uh, just asked, maybe Ikash, we know you're calling, it would be good again just to, to repeat the, the kind of problem solution that, that you're trying to address, because I think in the video, which was great, um, I think some of that was maybe a little bit lost in, in the video of that video, so do you want to just restate again exactly what problem you're trying to solve? Yes, so uh, basically, um, the scientists that we have been talking to uh, have identified a, a problem that um, when they want to reanalyze data that's already publicly available, it's very difficult to gather information from various places because uh, scientists have various solutions to publish data. So like we were mentioning in the video, some of them publish it in tables, some have MySQL servers, others use um, uh, solutions like Figshare. And so uh, this solution would be for scientists who want to gather information from various sources that's already available. So this will um, save them uh, money on doing the experiments. Uh, and uh, so the chair would be a, one place where scientists can easily gather information. And uh, yes, does that answer your question? So yes, thank you. Right. Yep, that does, thank you. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you. So, um, Martin, you're up. So, you have slides, right? Yeah, you can use that before you finish this. Hi everyone. Uh, uh, first and foremost, uh, thanks uh, to Digital Science for putting together this event and giving us the opportunity to to pitch our our product. My name is Martin Calvino. I'm the CEO and founder of Keyword. I came from New Jersey together with Neil. Neil, raise your hand. Uh, he's the main developer, and we're having uh, working together. So basically, what we do is we create and commercialize software that visualizes knowledge from digital libraries of research papers. So we are very passionate not only about visualizing the body of knowledge, but at the same time, visualizing the process by which scientists access that knowledge and query it. So very briefly, uh, the process, how many, uh, many in the audience must be scientists, so you are very familiar. Scientists access the body of knowledge by searching repositories such as Google Scholar, PubMed, and the Schumann's website download the find interesting articles, download them, manage them in libraries, and then they read. The managed process has been solved already, basically by software like Red Cube and Papers. So our product focuses upstream of the process of managing and downstream of it. And uh, specifically with keyword, you can extract, uh, increases your ability to visualize 4,000 papers at once. So this is the problem, what we are trying to solve. Uh, big data, scientists are not exempt from big data. So more and more and more articles are being published each week. So scientists have to search more, have to find more, have to download more, and ultimately they have to read it. So um, our flat icon, in white indicates all the problems we're trying to address and visualize to make a seamless transition for researchers. The conventional way to access the body of knowledge related to any keyword of your interest is by the conventional ways is you search, you find, 
the articles you are interested in, you download them, you manage with red keyword papers, and then you read them. So our solution is different. We want to search and download at the same time, visualize the process of searching and downloading thousands of articles at the, in, in parallel. Then we want to use natural language processing, visualization, design, and interactive charts to let you find which papers you want to read. So our approach is first download everything, keep it on the cloud, and then use natural language processing to query which papers you want to read. For instance, you can search and download from 400 journals in parallel, all at once, that contains your keyword of interest. Our business model is a cloud application with a subscription-based model. Our target customers are scientists and publishers. So on top of what we are already doing, we applied for a digital science catalyst, catalyst grant to put on top of knowledge visualization genome biology, specifically targeted for scientists in the life sciences. And for publishing, we want to offer our knowledge visualization so they can down scientists when they access nature publishing group journals or Elsevier journals or Springer journals, they can download in parallel articles from all their, their journals. So we have been lucky in obtaining seed capital and venture funding for this, and we have the responsibility to push our product forward. Um, and that would be it. And the question and answer, I would be delighted to show you a live demo if you allow me. But uh, first, if you don't have any further question, I can proceed to show you the product. So this is our, our website, and uh, very briefly, I'm going to show you the video. Sorry. This is a tango song that we, yeah, yeah. No, we don't music, yeah. So basically, what, what, what it does now, you create any library of your topic of interest, in this case, microRNA. Then let's say you have articles from your desktop and you drag them into the product. You upload them into the cloud. So as the, as the articles are being uploaded in real time, you can start visualizing a chart, a chart that tells you how many articles per year are in your library as they are uploading. So, in my case, my collection is from 2005 to 2012. And uh, most of my articles are from 2013. So here you can visualize how are the top keywords associated with your library. And let's say you want to complement your library. You go to here and you input microRNA and you download from 400 open access units at once all articles related with microRNA. Each seed, as the, as the download process it is being taken place, each circle represents one particular journal. The size of the circle represents how many articles containing microRNA are there. And the color represents the publisher. As a proof of concept, we did all, only open access. So you have in yellow, plus, in blue, Biomed Central, and in red, Frontiers. And downloading articles is as easy as clicking circles. As it is shown here, you, will can, you can see, you double click on article, on circles, and, and when the download is finished, like here, just click plus one, and I can download 100 papers at once. Then I selected genome biology and I wanted to download all of them together. You just click and then being uploaded to your library and you can visualize how, how the process takes place. 
So all the charts are interactive. In fact, you can query your whole library according to three keywords as, at once. You can play with the graph and interact with them, move the nodes around. Here I want to query my microRNA library with these three keywords, and they will search for them all together. So in this graph, all the dots relate to one PDF. The color of the dot is associated with the keyword of interest, microRNA in blue, genome in orange, and transcription in green. And you just open up PDF according to the amount of times that keyword were mentioned in your whole article. For instance, microRNA, there is one article in 2015 that mentioned it 100 times. And you just click on that dot and it will open the PDF for you. Here, you have the title for each PDF and you can open. And there you have. Okay, so I'm running out of time. If anyone um, want to explore the video further, please feel free to visit our website, or you can ask me, and I will be delighted to guide you through it. Thanks a lot. This time for one question, if you have any, yes. Very good. Uh, the question was, does the software integrate with it, uh, any citation management? And the, quest, and the answer is, we made our own. So here, this is in beta. We just launched the beta version today. Uh, no, uh, so, uh, recently. So here, you can visualize within your library which papers are being cited with each other. So on the, um, on the circumference, the radius, you have the titles of the article and the year. Alternating in black, and do I have a pointer here? Yeah, yeah, so here you have the year of the paper, the title. So in black, 2000, 2015, and then it goes 2014, 2013, until the, lay, the oldest paper in your library. So you can see here that this paper here has been cited by all this paper in 2015, and it cited all this paper in 2012. So you have a citation management manager for your specific library that is independently from Google Scholar or Thomson Reuters. So it, it, it guides you, if you have a library of 4,000 papers, it tells you which one you, you may start reading first as the most influential one. Okay, and then our last um, pitch is a video pitch um, from Cardio Analytics. And I just want to make sure, um, Samir, can you hear us? Samir, are you there? Um, we'll show this video anyways, and then if you can uh, come on for Q&A, we'll uh, be done.
MBA student at Oxford University. I'm one of three. We'll get it. Okay. My name is Samir Raza, and I'm a medical doctor and current MBA student at Oxford University. I'm one of three co founders of a startup called Cardio Analytics. With a team of researchers at the Institute of Biomedical Engineer, we're developing a software package to help researchers organize and interpret large biosignal data sets. In the last several years, there's been an explosion of wearable devices like Fitbit and the Apple Watch. And in the coming year, a variety of medically focused wearables will be hitting the market. My name is Samir Raza, and I'm a medical doctor at Oxford University. This year, over I want to believe the Signal analytics, and there are few tools to efficiently organize and interpret all this data that's been collected. Up to this point, the development of hardware has far outstripped that of software. Cardio Analytics intends to bridge this gap through the development of a software suite for researchers that enables efficient, accurate, and robust analysis of large biosignal data sets. Within our team, we have expertise in analyzing heart rhythm data, such as electrocardiography, bioimpedance, and pulse oximetry. Our goal is to develop software that can detect abnormal heart rhythms, such as atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation, or AF, is a major cause of stroke. It is a condition that affects over 1 million people in the United Kingdom, and a condition that causes over 35,000 strokes per year. In developing software to analyze heart rhythm data and enable early detection of atrial fibrillation, we hope to advance research in this field and ultimately help prevent thousands of strokes. While at Oxford University, we have developed expertise in the automated analysis of heart rhythm data through machine learning and signal processing. Currently, we have developed software algorithms to accurately analyze and interpret electrocardiographic data. Here's a quick look at our proof of concept device. Currently, we're using a device known as a shimmer to collect heart rhythm data. Fellow co-founder Julian is now connecting the device to his body to capture his heart rhythm signal. Once the device is connected, Bluetooth is then activated on the tablet to allow for wireless transmission of heart rhythm data from the shimmer device to the tablet. Julian will then select the form of biosignal data he wishes to visualize on his tablet. And in this demonstration, we will be visualizing electrocardiograph data. Using our algorithms, the heart rhythm data will be analyzed and a diagnosis will be displayed in the bottom right corner of the application. As you can see now, the heart rhythm data is appearing on the tablet. This proof of concept demonstrates our ability to collect, wirelessly transmit, and interpret heart rhythm data with over 98% accuracy using machine learning, a capability few researchers or companies in the world possess. Through funding from PitchFest and the Catalyst Grant Program, we are looking to adapt and enhance our software in three major ways. Firstly, we plan to incorporate additional types of heart rhythm data. Additional data such as pulse oximetry and bioimpedance would improve the accuracy and utility of our algorithms for researchers. Secondly, we intend to adapt the software to currently available wearable devices. Data from wearable devices represents a huge and untapped data set for researchers. By enhancing the algorithm to accommodate the input from open source wearable devices, we will allow researchers to access, analyze, and benefit from this huge treasure trove of data. Lastly, we plan to design a user-friendly cloud-based software interface for researchers to seamlessly import, organize, and interpret their data. Using a general public license, we plan to allow researchers to use our software free of charge. 
However, for commercial purposes, we will be charging a licensing fee. Cardio Analytics is at an early stage of development, and we're excited by the opportunity to apply for a digital science grant and compete in PitchFest. Through creation of our current software package, we've developed deep expertise in signal processing and machine learning. Two companies, Cardio City and Smart Care Sleep, have already approached us to discuss possible licensing, licensing and partnership. Given this experience, we, are confident, we feel confident in our ability to expand our software to provide researchers a more accurate and robust tool to access and analyze large data sets that were previously unavailable to them. Using our tools, we hope researchers will understand diseases like atrial fibrillation and stroke in more depth and be able to design more effective treatments. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our pitch and we look forward to hearing from you. My name is Samira. I just have a question about who owns the IP uh, for this uh, technology. Uh, so the IP was developed by uh, one of the researchers who is a co-founder. Uh, so part of the IP will be owned by the university. Uh, so we'll be having to discuss with them as well how to share uh, equity in a startup and either paying the university system fee or giving them uh, an equity portion of our company. I had uh, two separate questions. Uh, the first question is, uh, and on your demo, you're using a uh, tablet. Does it work for like just um, laptop computers, and, or more importantly, smartphones. Does it work for smartphones? And uh, separate question, other separate question was, will it detect anything for a heart attack? Uh, so first question is, uh, right now, it will work on a laptop and a tablet. We haven't developed the interface for a smartphone. Uh, we're still at an early stage of proof of concept, so we haven't tidied up the interface uh, to make it more user-friendly. So that's something we're hoping to do over the next six months. Uh, the second part, detecting a heart attack. So that's something that we're interested in. So there's a potential for that. And that will all depend on uh, the data set that we capture or analyze and the type of information that is being put in. Uh, so right now, um, people don't have access to the size of data sets, and then they don't have the analytical power to go through them. Uh, and this is just an emerging area where now these huge data sets are being created. So right now, people aren't really sure what to look for. Uh, to predict a heart attack using this real-time data. So it could be things such as heart rate variation, change in pulse pattern, oxygen levels uh, that could predict onset of heart attack in advance. Uh, so I don't have an answer at this point, but our hope is that through analyzing all the data that will be collected uh, in real time, that we'll be able to help researchers answer that. All right, um, if that was all the questions, I think that's all the pitches. So um, thank you from Cardio and the Lips. Yeah. All right, guys, so we're going to take a quick break. So um, if you want to go uh, take a look at the back wall, um, if you haven't already, uh, put your money in the envelope and back the startup that you would if you had $1,000 cash in your hands. And we'll come back in just about 10 minutes and hear um, about Tetra Science. Um, and founder Alok will tell you about what they've learned along the way since winning the Catalyst Grant last year.
Uh, my name is Alok. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Texture Science. Um, Texture Science is an Internet of Things platform for R&D. Uh, we basically connect scientific equipment to the web such that researchers can remotely monitor and control experiments, receive alerts when things go wrong, and automatically capture data. Uh, we're fortunate enough to be uh, not only a Catalyst grant winner, but also a, a Y Combinator funded company as well. Um, so basically, we sell hardware and software that basically plugs into your existing scientific equipment. You can monitor it from yourself on a computer and capture all the data. So a lot of those really painful tasks, we have to go back in the lab late at night to monitor or to perform a task, you can actually do now remotely from home from yourself on a computer. Um, so we've basically sort of been at this for about a year now. A team of serial entrepreneurs from Harvard and MIT have almost 10 people now and serve everyone from large pharmaceutical companies to major hospitals to top universities. And it's been a really interesting ride, I guess, having not only the support of digital science, but also of uh, the Boston scientific community as well. And so when Alex sort of gave me the opportunity to speak here, she mentioned that I should sort of talk a little bit about what we've learned over the past year or so. Um, and so I could talk to you a lot about you know, value proposition and technology and business models, but I think instead those are things that you can probably learn from other folks like Ryan or Steve. Um, but instead maybe I'll talk about some of the things that you might not hear often, which I've sort of personally learned as an individual and as, a, as, a, as an entrepreneur. And those three things sort of fall into categories you might not see elsewhere, which are character and values, judgment, and uh, selfishness, which I'll sort of comment on. But at the end of the day, I think when you're an entrepreneur, you're sort of the one who's responsible for your company as well as its vision and how you execute on that. 
And I think an important part of doing that is sort of your own personal character and values. And I'm sure all of us have been in situations, personal and professional, where we've worked with people or in circumstances that have uh, been less than a good fit in terms of values. And so I would certainly encourage entrepreneurs, and I've definitely been in your position before, to not be shy about leveraging your own personal values in terms of how you recruit people, how you vet partners, customers, and suppliers as well. You know, we've been in multiple situations where our backs were against the wall, where we'd either have to compromise on our values in order to get a product at the door, or we'd lose a whole bunch of revenue. And in every single case, we've always sided with our character and values that have actually never regretted it in any certain circumstance. So I definitely encourage all those entrepreneurs out there never to feel pressure to do something that you don't feel is right. And that doing the right thing, as cliche as it might sound, is, is always the right thing to do. And that sort of brings me to my second point, which is judgment. And I think when you talk about a lot of big companies, and you know, Perkin Elmer, for example, being one of them, or Nature Publishing Group being one of them, one thing that always differentiates companies, big or small, could be things like, say, technology, or business model, or uh, sales force. But one thing I'd like to you guys also think a little bit about is how your judgment can also be a differentiator and a competitive advantage for you. At the end of the day, your judgment, which is the decision that you make, are also based on your character and values, and also is an indication of what type of company you want to build and what type of company you are. So how you treat customers, how you treat employees, how you treat partners and suppliers, all comes down to judgment. And so definitely I wouldn't hesitate also in that case too to leverage your own personal judgment because that's what differentiates you as a small business versus a big one. And so I think the last point I'd also want to touch upon, which I think is sort of off the beaten path, is an element of what I call sort of selfishness. And someone once asked me what I love and what I hate about being an early stage entrepreneur. And I think the thing I'd say I hate the most about being an entrepreneur, especially an early stage one, is that I feel like I'm always taking. You know, I take from my customers, I take from my early employees, I take from investors, uh, I take from my beautiful girlfriend or my family who support me emotionally and financially. And it becomes a situation where it's always sort of about the business or what we're trying to build as opposed to them or what I should be doing for them. And so I think something about being an early stage entrepreneur is that you also accrue this emotional debt, which is that in the long run you have the opportunity, you have the responsibility to give back what you've sort of taken while you were at an early stage. And so as you sort of go through this process of building your own big billion dollar company that's gonna take over the world, definitely keep in mind those people who are there for you early on, whether it's your family, your mentors, um, your early customers, because they're the ones who are taking the risk and who are investing in you net net, and those are the ones you sort of have a responsibility to afterwards. So you know, those are the things that I'd say we've sort of learned over the past year or so, um, and you know, we've actually been really fortunate to have Digital Science as a partner. You know, one of the things that sort of motivated us to work with them in the first place is that they have a tremendous amount of conviction around the problem that we're trying to solve, which is helping scientists do research better. And so you'll find very few investors, much less mentors and advisors and um, guides out there who have that same level of conviction. And so I definitely say take advantage of that opportunity. So yeah, with that, um, be happy to answer any questions you guys might have about Cal's grant or about Tetra Science or building a company here in Boston. Thanks. Yeah, great question. So at the end of the day, we're basically trying to empower the Internet of Things in the laboratory. So we're trying to do for the lab what NEST has done for the home by connecting scientific equipment to the cloud. So for us, you know, many people who start companies because they see this massive market opportunity or a lot of dollar numbers behind it. For me personally, um, for most folks when they're a kid, their first job is doing a paper route where they deliver papers in their neighborhood. For me at 15, 16, it was actually doing laboratory automation for nanotechnology. So this is actually a problem I've been working on for almost 15 years now. And it sort of came to the forefront where I had met a guy from MIT who actually had done web-based software, but had done research in the past five years. And then a guy from Harvard who had built scientific hardware, but had done research for the past 10 years. And so it really became to the forefront where we had the right sets of pieces, hardware and software, as well as I had actually started a company in my past life, which does open innovation and business development. So when all those pieces fit together, we also set the precipice of this unique opportunity where you have Wi-Fi and the IoT is sort of a really huge trend. That sort of really gave us sort of the jumping off point where everyone sort of wants the ability to really remotely monitor and control stuff. So that was our motivation. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. 
Can you say that last word again? I mean, uh, how it's different from what? Sure. So what I'll say is that Simon Equipment is about $44 billion a year spent in the domain. Awesome hardware, but the software is often lacking. It either requires you to physically operate the instrument in person, live, or uh, it requires this big, massive PC that has a lab view running on it. They have to program to get it to work remotely. So instead, what we do is we sell a small little Google Chromecast-like hardware module, which plugs into the computer port and allows you to view it basically but from Wi-Fi, from your cell phone or computer anywhere in the world. So now you can remotely monitor, say, your hot plate or your freezer. You can control a syringe pump or a PCR machine from anywhere in the world and automatically capture that data on the cloud. Therefore, you no longer have to worry about, say, writing something in a lab notebook. You no longer have to fumble with USB drives to pull data off the machine. It's actually all accessible in a far more user-friendly and far more dynamic user interface. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so there's definitely a couple of companies that say manufacture large instruments which are connected to, a, say, a PC. You can jerry-rig or Rube Goldberg uh, an opportunity to be able to plug those instruments to the cloud by using, say, VNC viewer. Um, but those are often kludged together solutions which are often not reliable given how IP addresses are managed and changed within an institution. Um, there are some companies that are manufacturing, say, wireless monitoring systems for like freezers or incubators. And so there's some of these bolt-on solutions which are coming about. We're trying to build a cross-vendor platform which can do everything in one place. Our personal thesis is that you don't want an application for your freezer, which is separate than your application for your PCR machine. You kind of want one application that allows you to do all those things in one place and requires very little cognitive overhead as a result. Yeah. As an entrepreneur, how do you manage your time on a day-to-day -day basis? <laughs> it's a really good question. And to be honest, I'm going back to the selfishness part, not very well. Um, we're really fortunate in that we have customers which are the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world, the best hospitals, as well as the most prestigious academic institutions. And the challenge when you only have a nine, 10 person team is that you're resource constrained. And so you don't have enough time to be able to go work with them every week or every month to figure out what their new pain points are and make sure that the service is working well for them. But we try our best to do that. Um, thankfully, we're within a couple of T-stops away from all of our customers. So if something breaks, we're on site immediately or within the next day to go fix it. But now that we're part of Y Combinator, we have a whole bunch of big pharmaceutical companies on the West Coast now that are stepping up. So we need to think very strategically about how we allocate those resources. So unfortunately, I don't have a silver bullet for you. But what I'll say is that perhaps related to the point of judgment, which I made before, is invest again in those customers, because those are going to be the passionate ones who help you grow. Uh, as a frame of reference, one of the major pharmaceutical companies we work with um, is about to bring a new drug to market. And we're basically the gatekeeper between them and a $2.2 billion a year revenue stream. And so the interesting thing is that our champion, our main user there who implemented the whole system, he has a huge position where number three on his uh, responsibilities is to implement TetraScience site-wide across that entire firm. So my job is basically to help empower him as a champion for us to make him succeed. So you know, if you learn anything that I don't know about, please let me know because I'd love to figure out how to do it better. Thanks a lot, guys. We know we went over time. Um, so as you know, we had two awards. Uh, one was for the judge's choice, and one was for the audience's choice. We would like to thank all the presenters for coming out, and please keep in mind that you all are still included in the, in the Catalyst Prize consideration, um, and you'll be contacted for more information from those groups um, uh, shortly. But we would like to uh, award the judge's choice to 
Nimmer Insights. Audience choice goes to illuminate. All right, again, thank you so much. We hope to have more of these events coming in the future. Uh, if you have any questions, please, you're welcome to stay. We're here to hang out. So we'll have some of the judges here as well as some of the other portfolio members involved with digital science. If you have any questions, um, and for any of us, um, but again, thank you and have a great night.